My entire life seems to have been centered around adaptation. Natural selection, the process where animals learn to survive better in their environment, seems to be very emblematic of my life. I feel a strange sense of closeness with these animals because they get thrown challenges from left and right. Now that seems dramatic, um, but I'd argue that it's been enough to deal with at the tender age of 21. I don't say any of this to garner any pity from any of you. If anything, I'd like to distance myself from that. I simply want to show you how a non-athlete jumps some hurdles. So to start with, I was not born here. I was born in that soggy little island called the United Kingdom, specifically <laughs> England. <laughs> I moved here in 2008 with my parents and my siblings. We gathered up everything we had into five tiny boxes and suitcases and boarded a nine-hour flight to Calgary. It was not fun. My sister was too. It was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I had a new school, new friends, new country, new lexicon. Yes, British English really is different to Canadian English. <laughs> Suddenly, I had to relearn how to be in this new country. It was hard to adjust. Granted, I'm a white English-speaking immigrant, but it was still challenging. I had people asking about my accent every single day. My classmates thought it was hilarious. I had shouts of crumpets and do you know the queen? <laughs> Which obviously I don't because I'm a lowly peasant, right? <laughs> this is not the face of royalty. <laughs> Slowly but surely, I had to learn how to change my language and my accent to avoid the daily torments. Trousers became pants. Rubber became eraser. Water became water. That one still doesn't, it doesn't sit well. <laughs> Eventually, I figured out how to deal with this. And uh, though being an immigrant is like playing life on hard mode, I like to think that I've bumped it up to a solid medium. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the age of 10, I was served an Indiana Jones-style boulder my way. I was diagnosed with something called Tourette's syndrome. Now, just as a disclaimer here, my Tourette's doesn't really flare up too much to the point where I swear or anything, so don't worry, no one has to censor this talk. <laughs> Tourette's syndrome is a complex, and I mean complex, neurological disorder that causes unwanted movements and noises called tics. And I had just started grade six. <laughs> Neurologists don't exactly hand out guidebooks on how to have Tourette's. Um, it's certainly a challenge trying to navigate a neurotypical world that wasn't made for you. There were so many chances um, for my Tourette's to come out, and they did pretty darn frequently. There was no rhyme or reason to when my flare-ups came up, and I felt completely lost in how to have it. I knew nobody else with Tourette's, and it's genuinely terrifying to feel your consciousness take a backseat to the angry Hulk-type monster inside of you. <laughs> Slowly but surely, I figured out how to dissuade my tics, pretend that I was sniffly, Ironically, I have asthma, so sometimes I genuinely am sick when I sniffle. <laughs> it's a two-way street. But unfortunately, uh, Tourette's usually comes with some added packages. I discovered that it is not just a singular diagnosis. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a buy one, get one deal. You always come with a free gift. <laughs> Mine turned out to be OCD, anxiety, and depression. <laughs> is that good? It's like Amazon Prime, that stuff. Uh, <laughs> suddenly, I not only had to worry about people noticing my tics, but I had added anxieties about what those people looking at me thought. OCD sent me into concentric thought spirals, like being trapped inside of a constricting python. And it's a little difficult to think your way out of that one when all your body wants to do is crash and burn in a corner in the middle of a bright red circle on the floor. <laughs> If anything, it was less than productive for my life. Um, all the OCD part of my brain wanted to do while I was driving was steer me off the road into ongoing traffic. Not exactly helpful. <laughs> and all of this uh, dysfunction uh, culminated during my uh, grade 12 year of high school, in which I had a severe bout of depression. Yes, this is going to get a little sad for a while, but don't worry, it picks up at the end. <laughs> My brain was in the worst state it had ever been in in my entire life. I was depressed, fatigue, 
daily panic attacks, suicidal, the whole nine yards. <laughs> it's not a fun time. My boyfriend, Joey, who's watching this, um, genuinely saved my life that day when he called my parents in concern. And it was the day before his birthday. <laughs> Girlfriend of the Year Award, right here. <laughs> I hated him for that, genuinely, for many months. But slowly as my personality returned, I grew to appreciate the gesture. Luckily, I had a wonderful psychologist and psychiatrist who helped me, and really a lot of my recovery centered around learning as well. Cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT to anyone that's familiar with it, works on the process of helping your brain to relearn how to think properly. And my thinking was absolutely down the toilet. <laughs> Eventually, I developed strategies to help myself combat these things, but they never really leave you. I would go to the dog park with my dad to snuggle puppies. It's a genuine form of therapy, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually, everything kind of started on an upswing. In the meanwhile, I had just started university, I was making new friends, I was rocking my classes, I was, I was riding on Aladdin's magic carpet. <laughs> I was wall the way up. Instead, a separate part of my body decided to rebel against me and gave me a little something called endometriosis. A long word, I know, but trust me, it's even more complicated to diagnose. <laughs> Basically, the tissue similar to the lining inside my uterus decided to spread its wings and grow outside of my uterus. It's awesome, causing symptoms like pain, fatigue, mental health problems. Didn't we already cover that one? <laughs> Infertility, it, just anything you can think of, it caused that. I had to fight with the doctors for such a long time to believe my pain, and unfortunately had to learn that the best way to sometimes get people to listen to you is to go into their office and scream and cry at them. Now, I shouldn't have to do that to get appropriate medical treatment, but finally, at the age of 21, after eight years of trying to gain a diagnosis, I'm slowly on my way to treatment. So this place, the University of Lethbridge has actually been a site of a lot of my learning, not necessarily in an academic sense. I hope none of my professors are here. <laughs> Being a disabled immigrant student comes with a lot of explaining, and quite frankly, it would be exhausting to tell every single one of you individually about my different diagnoses. So this is just 400 birds with one stone. <laughs> I decided that I would instead shout it from the rooftops, these things that I have often hit about myself. I tell everybody in my sorority, I tell everyone at clubs and at parties, and if I pass them in the grocery store, frankly, I think they're sick of me. They're like, we get it, Rosie, you're disabled, and you're English, you have freckles, dimples, it's adorable. Like, <laughs> This has really helped me to educate a lot of the people around me. Now my roommates know if I'm feeling twitchy, they know that it's just a part of me, it's nothing different. They know that my accent sounds like this, apparently. <laughs> the other place, or should I say camp, that actually facilitated a lot of my learning was something called the Tim Howard Leadership Academy. This is out in New Jersey, in the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome heralded, in fact, by Tim Howard, a soccer player with Tourette syndrome. After two long flights and a delayed one back there, <laughs> trying to get to New Jersey, I walked into a room full of 30-plus kids with Tourette's, laughing and ticking, and it was enough to almost bring you to tears. <laughs> because I had never met anyone with Tourette syndrome in my entire 18 years of being alive. They accepted me in about two seconds, which I think was a new record. They didn't have to ask any questions. It was amazing. <laughs> and uh, they taught me so many strategies and just basically how to not care what anybody else thought. So there's a saying that survival expert Bear Girls has that I rather um, identify with, which is adapt, overcome, survive. I have a little problem with that middle one, and you may have seen in the title of my talk that I talk about hurdling which I do not do, I was a ballerina. <laughs> <laughs>
we have this kind of notion that you have to overcome certain things in order for them to be met as a goal. But I can't really overcome things that never go away. I was given a hurdle, I learned how to jump over that first one. But a hurdler is never just do one jump and go, that's it, I'm finished, gold medal to me for hurdles. No, right? They have another hurdle, and then another one, and then another one. Do you see the pattern? There's more hurdles. <laughs> So instead, I simply learned how to get better at jumping over the first hurdle and better at jumping over the second hurdle, whatever they might be, whether it was medical or personal, physical, anything of that nature. So if I can leave you with anything, it's that a lot of my learning not necessarily has, evolved, has revolved around knowing how to get over things, but rather how to take the scenic route around, which, fun fact, is how I did hurdles in high school. <laughs> like I said, ballerina. These broken legs don't work. The world really wasn't made for me, so a lot of my learning centered about how to kind of make me for the world instead. Thank you.